Okay, we're rolling. This is an interview in Schenectady, New York. It is the 30th of April, 2004, approximately 1.10 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your name, full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yeah, Joseph Samuel Dominelli, uh, born in Schenectady, New York, August 11th, 1917. What was your uh, educational background prior to entering service? High school. Okay. Do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I sure do. I was watching a football game on TV, a professional football game when they first started in the leagues years ago. And uh, if I recall correctly, it was the game that had the highest score in professional football history. That got the team got beat. I forget the names of the teams, but that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I think it was Sunday, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you remember your reaction to the? Oh. To this? I can remember very clearly. It was such a shocking thing that people were running out of their houses where I lived on Eighth Avenue in Schenectady, and people were, oh, what's going on? They're going to. They thought they were bombing this country. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. And people were. People were. Very frightened. Police cars came up the streets. I mean, they thought, hey, what the hell are we we're getting bombed here, you know? But when we analyzed the whole thing and settled down, the bombing wasn't naturally Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. But even the, even the military thought that they were going to be bombed in Washington or California or uh, other places in the United States, really. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. Um, where were you, uh, where did you receive your basic training? Camp Cross, South Carolina. I can't use the word I want to say, but uh, hot and uh, rural. And the only city nearby was a small city of about 10,000 people. Spartanburg. Today it's a metropolitan city. Mm -hmm. uh, was this the first real time you were away from home, or had you been away well, from home? Well, basically, before? yes, really. Did you get homesick at all? Or? No, really, I wasn't. I uh, My biggest problem was I had, uh, my wife just had a baby. We had a little baby, oh, so and they still took married. me. I was married. When did you get married? I was married, oh, what year? Hmm. 1940, 39, mm -hmm. 40. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you had a wife and a little baby then when you left. Right. How did you keep in contact with them? Did you write all, write often, or? Well, when you're in basic training, you don't have too much time to write. They work you night and day. Yeah. Uh, I forget the number of weeks were down there. I think it was. I went in in October. I left there probably around February. It's quite a few, quite a few weeks in basic training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you? Uh, Given it, were you given any specialty training uh, and any special weapons, or what? What that basic training really is is what the word implies. It's just a basic mm -hmm. trans. They're transforming you from a citizen to a soldier mm -hmm. as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. Discipline, taking care of your own self, your body, your clothing, your bed, going out in the field, taking you down the woods and leaving you there, find your way back. Teach you how to read a compass. Of course, a lot of time is spent on the rifle range shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, various uh, weapons you shoot. Then they put you on trial runs, you know, they form teams. And you know, like actual combat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you do that for maybe a week or so. But it's, it's, it's what it implies. It's just a basic uh, training course. That train you from a citizen to become a soldier. And it's a tough thing to do. Did you uh, go to any other uh, specialized training elsewhere, or did you? No, just the regular basic. Tra I tried, very frankly, uh, when they shipped me, when we, I completed my basic training, they shipped me home, and they sent me to New Jersey, which was like a port of embarkation. Uh, I asked to be transferred to the Rangers. I, want, I, was, I was 26 years old. I was in excellent physical condition. I used to work out all the while. I played professional basketball. And uh, 
guy said to me, he said, well, that shouldn't be hard for you to do. He says, are you married? I says, yeah. You have any children? And I says, yeah, one. You're not going to be no ranger. They wouldn't take married men. They wouldn't take people with children. Because that was the group of people who were going to when you get killed, you're going to get killed being a ranger. Yes. But no, I didn't uh, go to no specialized school uh, training. No. Mm -hmm. um, you ended up the 29th Division. Were you assigned to that before you went overseas? No. I was assigned to it overseas. Okay. Um, when you go overseas after a basic training, you're what they call a replacement person. Okay. You're not attached to, they got a special patch that indicates that you are a recruit ready to be attached to a division. Mm -hmm. And they call you a replacement. That's exactly what you are. And that's what I was. I was a replacement. I went over on the uh, the old Queen Mary, which is now docked out in California. Mm -hmm. 15,000 people on one ship. Slept like a rat, you know, just top of one another. And not pleasant. So you went over on a single ship then, because usually the Mary went over alone. Okay, where did you go uh, arrive uh, when you... I arrived in uh, <clears throat> Went overseas. Scotland. Yeah. Uh, Firth of Clyde, they call it. Which is between Ireland and Scotland. Mm -hmm. There's a little thing in there. and That's where we got off there and put us on trains. And went to a real... <clears throat> about a day, day and a half. Went to a real rural area and they put us in trucks and brought us up on the mountains. Whatever mountains they are in England, not too many. But just old farms, as they really were, they took over the farms from the people. They just took them over. And within one day, we built the tent city in one day. I bet we had 50,000 guys there. In one day. And they fed you. Can you imagine that? That's where I was. That's where we did some training. Uh, out of boats, climbing down nets. Were you assigned to a unit by then? You still were in the replacement temple. No, I, I was assigned a, a unit. See, D-Day was the 6th of June. They moved us out of that area to Southampton area, the coast of England, you know. Mm -hmm. Huge replacement depots, huge. They took over the whole city, really. Cities. Moved people out and put them up in the woods. That's what they really did. They took everybody's home. And uh, that's when I was assigned to the 29th Division. And that was in, let me see, that probably was in sometime in the first part of May. And we trained uh, in boats cargo nets off of ships and getting you ready to go to a landing craft, you know. Mm -hmm. And we did that until it comes, I think it was probably the last part of May, I was sent over to the 29th Division, which I didn't know was an assault division. And the only, <laughs> the only fortunate part of it was I was assigned to the 115th Regiment. The 116th Regiment was the Assault Regiment. And whether you know it or not, they were wiped out right on the beach. Just about the whole regiment. Mm -hmm. We were laid offshore. And, and they kept telling us, you know, we were lucky guys. We're laying offshore. You're not going to be committed for two or three days. The 116th will go in there and they'll clean the whole area out. And then you're going to walk in. Well, that didn't happen. They went in early in the morning, about 9.30 in the morning, we were committed. Bodies laying all over, all over the ground, in the water. They wiped out the whole goddamn division, the regiment rather. It was a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, well, you see, when you don't have intelligence, really, what you're really going to walk into, mm -hmm. you're caught with everything. <clears throat> Once we got in there, and you develop intelligence. Uh, one of the bravest men I've ever seen in my whole life, in fact, I think he saved that beach, was a man 
he probably was in his 50s. He was a brigadier general. His name was Norman Cota. Tough guy. Carried a walking stick. That guy walked around that beach encouraging soldiers to move, 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 lay down, you know, try to save their lives. Never was hit once. Never was hit once. And he saved that beach. He finally got us into the, into the, against the cliff. Now he had to go up that cliff to get to the top of the hill. They drop hand grenades on you, you know, just drop them down, roll them on you. Terrible, terrible scene. People, so many people died. So many people got killed there. It was pitiful. And hey, I never... Uh, can I go back a second? Yeah. Uh, what was it like when you, when it became daylight and you saw the entire invasion fleet? What was your impression of that? Well, that's a good question. Because in your whole life you're never going to see anything like it. Thousands and thousands of ships. You look around, holy, you couldn't believe what you were seeing. I was on a, like a Liberty ship that was taking me out. They take you out halfway, almost, then they drop cargo nets down. You crawl down the net and get into a landing craft. That's how they do it. Landing craft by the thousands, thousands. I looked, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Oh my God, we got to be able to overwhelm that beach in no time. And the 116th was already in. And we didn't know they were getting slaughtered on that beach. Now, when you were, you were going in in your craft, was it under fire all the way in? Or well, the, 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 no. The, when I was, when I got off the, the ship, got into the landing craft, mm -hmm. we went out to a certain area and they stopped us right. because the 116th was going in. We were told we wouldn't go in for two days. Maybe 9, 3, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. They says... You're committed. You gotta go. Said, what the hell happened? That's when we seen bodies floating in the, in the ocean, all over the place. And they drove us. The guys driving them boats, you know, they want to drop you quick and get the hell out of there. See, so they drop you. They drop the front down so you get off. Now you got a full field pack on your back and a rifle. I seen guys that were maybe five eight, five seven, five six. They drown. Right, they disappear. I was six foot lucky, and that's when we started screaming. One guy took a gun and pointed at the guy and said, move this in closer, I'll shoot you. So he moved the boat in closer. He would have shot him. Mm -hmm. Then when I got off, it was up like to my waist. I was fine. I had to make sure to get up and I'd be and lay down. I got up and laid down flat, and I could see all these bodies. What they were doing, they were, they were tripping landmines. They cleared it, actually, they cleared it for us, really. So we were able to get to the front of the hill and lay there. And that's when this general walk up and down all over the place. He's, he's we got to get out of here. we got to get up on that hill. Got to get on that hill. I says, yeah, you go first. Son of a bitch, don't he lead us up that hill? I never see a man like him. And he wasn't a physically powerful built guy. He was a 50-year-old man. Got us up the hill. And when he got up on top of the hill, then you run into all kind of uh, machine gun fire, mortar fire, uh, all that kind of thing, you know? Artillery fire. It never stopped. It never stopped. Because they knew they had to get us out of there or forget about it. We walked through a swamp. I'll never forget that god darn, that swamp was a terrible, terrible stunk. And there's, you know, you're dirty, all water and coming out of the water on top of it and we got to a we were supposed to occupy the village of St. Lowe day one well that's June the 6th we didn't get into St. Lowe till the first part of actually July and I was wounded outside of St. Lowe the first time Shrapnel I got hit with. What day were you uh, wounded? I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. It's heavy artillery barrage and piece of got ducked down in a hole. And I got hit in the leg with a piece of shrapnel. Yeah. It was a pretty good wound, you know. 
I said, maybe I'm safe now. I'll go back. They sent me back to the first aid station, took the thing and cleaned it all up, wrapped it up, sent me back in. I said, I can't believe this. That was the first time I was wounded. Our division, I forget the exact date, in July, we took St. Lowe finally. And once we took St. Lowe, that was a major, major victory. Because actually, uh, well, the only reason why, as I recall, we took St. Lowe was because General Patton's army was released behind us, the Third Army. And, of course, when he got released, them tanks, they went. They went around St. Lowe in one day, knocked everybody out, went out to, all the way to Brest, France. And that's where he stopped, Patton. He stopped in Brest, France. They encircled it. Then they put us on trucks and brought us to Brest, France. We, we, we took the outskirts of Brest, France. That was our, our objective was to take Brest, France. That was our, our thing. Patton, he left. He went to Paris. You know how fast he went. But we were left there in, in, in Brest, France, and they told us nothing to it. Not too many soldiers there. You know what was there? They had Royal Marines, they had paratroopers, regular army, all kind of soldiers there that we didn't know about. It was one hell of a fight, like almost two weeks. They committed an act there that we found out later. They took several thousand French people. They herded them, brought them to the edge of the cliff and machine gun, and let them jump into the ocean. Just kill them. That's what we were up against. Every time we got a prisoner, we had, we had a lot of guys that, that joined us later on were from the south. uneducated from the farms and never been anywhere but tremendous soldiers a lot of guts could shoot like hell like to kill people you know they really did they killed you could never let if you got prisoners and you told three of these crackers to take the prisoners back to the holding area they'd be gone like 10 minutes they'd shoot them and come back they wouldn't take them they'd kill them Terrible, isn't it? But they did it. And that's the way it went. Uh, nobody ever said anything about it. Who cared? You had to feed them. They shot them instead. That's what they did. I never seen it. But we knew what happened. Mm -hmm. Had to happen. But uh, it took, uh, I don't recall how long it took before we could take uh, Brest, France. That's a big city. It's a real big city. First time I went into a big city like that overseas. We were walking into uh, five and ten cents, just like State Street in Schenectady. Ten cent store, walk in, look around, nothing there. Walk into a bank, no money in it. Strange feeling. Go in a bank, look all around the bank, open all the vaults, didn't find a penny, right? But that's what you did. Did you ever have much contact with the people of France? Not in the combat area, no. Mm -hmm. No. Well, they, they, when you were coming, they were gone. Mm -hmm. They were gone. They, uh, they hopefully got out of there, you know what I mean? They wouldn't want to be in a, you, They couldn't live in a combat zone. They'd be killed. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they evacuated themselves, truthfully. If they got away from the Germans, they'd... They go behind behind our lines. They were safe, and they get they get food. They suffered something terrible. They really did. But I don't know if they appreciate it today the way they treat us in Frenchmen. Yeah. <laughs> How long were were you in combat? Well. I was in combat from June, and I was wounded the last time, the latter part of October of the following year. What type of weapon did you carry? I, me? I carried a, uh, oh, jeez, what the hell they call 
not an M1, let's see, it's smaller. Uh, carbine? Carbine. Carbine, carbine, yeah. Uh, I finally got myself into what they call a, a mortar squad. So my, 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 my job was to carry two bags of shells, mortar shells. Mm -hmm. and, and I had the carbine, which was a smaller gun to carry. And what rank were you at that point? Huh? What rank were you? Private first class, that's all. I could have been a sergeant in two minutes if I wanted it. Who don't want it? Mm -hmm. Could have been a lieutenant right in the field if you wanted it. They couldn't get anybody to take them. There was no sergeants. Very rare. Everybody got killed. No, you uh, were wounded a second time. Do you, where was that and when? I got wounded in uh, breast. Oh, the actual Yeah, I got shot. It, it shrapnel on my legs. And in my hand or arm, I got shot. Uh, in fact, I got shot with what they call a uh, a phosphorus a phosphorus grenade, which throws off shrapnel plus a burning power. It burned all my leg, burned my pants, my arms. They sent me back. They sent me back again. They wouldn't let you. You know, they wouldn't keep you. But. I forget what time we left. When the hell did we leave? Uh, Breast fell and uh, had to be sometime in September, maybe. Because then they put us on troop train and sent us to Germany. Put you on boxcars. And then we transport us all the way across, from one end of France all the way across France into Germany. I took a few, few days, I'll tell you. Terrible. Packing in them cars like rats. How did you get fed? Did you, did you just work, live on your rations? Every so often they would stop mm -hmm. and they'd come by with trucks and throw food in there, boxed rations. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. they throw it into the, they would hand it, they'd throw it right into the car and you'd scrubble for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Like animals, that's all it is. Uh, not, 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 they, they don't let you off the car, get in line to eat like a gentleman now. You're going to Germany. When we got to Paris, a lot of guys left. They took off. They, they just deserted. They didn't give a goddamn. If I hadn't had a wife and kid, I might have done, I might have thought about it. Because if you didn't show up, they sent a telegram home that your husband is missing an action. I don't want that to happen. So many guys left. They really did. Then they put armed guards. <laughs> Every time they stopped the train, they'd have armed guards to keep you on the train. No, you can't blame them. Did you ever go for hour and hour? Did I? Yeah. No. No. So you know, USO shows or anything like that? Uh, no, you're in a combat unit. The guys in the back, they had, they had it made. I would have loved them in a sign in the back, but you don't get them jobs. Once you're up front, they keep you there until you get killed. Now, where did you go into, into Germany? What part of Germany? Well, actually, when we went to Germany, I can... Uh, To, uh, right on the border of Holland and Germany, that's where we went. Mm -hmm. It's called Masterich, Holland. And that's where our division occupied the line. That's only 25 miles from Aachen. That was the biggest city in Germany that we had to take was Aachen. Mm -hmm. and that was going to be a terrible battle, which it was. So, I was there for, I forget how long, They used to do these things, it's, it's, it's traditional like with Army. They sent patrols out, scouting patrols, to pick up intelligence. Never forget it. We were along a huge hedgerow. 
laying there. And I turn around, I see it looked like 40 people marching, maybe 300 yards away, in a line. And I never forgot the words till this day. I says, they can't be our people. Our people are coming from the other way. All at once I hear a voice. Never forget it. Come and see here, Conrad. You know what that means? Come here, brother. I, Jesus Christ, they're German. As soon as they said that, all our, a couple of our stupid fools, instead of laying down and keeping their mouths shut, they start shooting at them. Well, when they start shooting at them, they deployed, sent machine guns, were spraying that whole area. I was in good shape. I was six foot. Must have weighed about 140, 150 at the time. And I was standing behind this hedgerow, which was thick, probably seven foot high. Believe me when I tell you, I got over that hedgerow in one leap. Right over it. And I got into the other side. Where am I going? Where the hell am I going to go? I had a lot of guys with me. So, when you're in the service, the first thing they tell you when you go to a city, you always set up a machine gun at the head of the street so you can spray the street. I forgot all about that because you're in the anxiety and the fear. And all them streets are all cobblestone. So we all ran. We were running down the street. And all at once, just what I said, the guy, they set up a machine gun, and the, and the bullets were bouncing off the cobblestones. I said, like, get out of this goddamn street. So I ran, and, and down there, the garage doors are huge. They're thick, and they're eight, nine feet tall, and they're double. We call them a garage. They use them for sitting. They use them for anything, you know, part of the house, really. Well, that's where we went. We went into one of them. And when we pushed the door open, little did I know, there was a German on the other end of it. And he sprayed the, us with a machine gun. It hit me in the arm, legs. Down I went. I just, but somebody else that was with me killed him. He says, they grabbed the hole of me. Two guys did. Never forget it. They grabbed me. And they, we ran out the other end of the building, the, the garage. And they said, well, we got to go back this way because our line, the main line, was back. We were the we were the the uh, combat like unit in the front, intelligence unit. They grabbed me on each side, and what do you think you run through? A cabbage patch. Now, did you ever run through a cabbage patch? You know what noise that makes, and you couldn't help it. Now we hear bullets, they're starting to spray in a whole cabbage field. None of us got hit. Finally, we got back where we thought our line was, and we didn't have the password. You get a, pass, you get a different password every day. We didn't know what the password was. We didn't know if the guys in front of us were German or American. So they sprayed a couple of shots, the Americans. The guys got to holler out. Joe DiMaggio. The guy says, New York Yankees. Honest to God, Americans, come on, come on. A matter of maybe 100 yards, we got back to our line. I was lucky. And that was the end of me. That's when I went back to the hospital. And that's when I stayed. So you were wounded three times? Three times. Yeah. Now you uh, received a bronze star. Where did you receive that? See? I'll tell you the truth, I didn't receive none until I got in the hospital. Ah. I never knew where they, they gave me one for D-Day, mm -hmm. they gave me one for breast, and they gave me one <laughs> when I got wounded in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's why I assume they have a letter that goes with it. But uh, you never know if you got a medal or not. Mm -hmm. I got in the hospital in Paris. Beautiful hospital, really. Uh, I was there for about maybe... Ten days, they couldn't do nothing for me. So he said, we're going to send you back to England. Oh, was I so happy. I go back to England, I'm safe, you know. But in Paris, I, they treat us, treat us great, really, they did. Uh, good food, you know. 
And after about a week and a half, a guy comes by, look, he says, uh, you got to go back to England. I says, oh, really? Yeah. And they did. They, they loaded us in a plane. They flew us back to England. Landed in Wales. I'll never forget that jerk town. Terrible place. We spent two nights there. And from there, I went to a place in a big hospital in, uh, I can't think of the name of the, uh, I can't think of the name of that city. I should remember it, but I can't. Good sized city. And that's where I stayed in the hospital for quite a while until they sent me back to the United States. When they told me I was being sent back to the United States, wow. This doctor used to walk down a ward every day, and we used to watch him. If you seen him go near the guy and whisper in his ear, you knew that guy was going home. But if he walked right by your bed, forget it, you're, there, you're going to be there, you know. He walked by my bed for weeks on end, they left the son of a gun, never whispers in my ear. <laughs> so finally the guy came up, because you see, in them days, well you can see here these scars, your nerves in your arm are thinner than your hair. Are you aware of that? I knew, yes, your yeah. nerves are very small. They, this was all new to the medical profession. They never had surgeons that could do this kind of work. Didn't have them. So in, in effect, they were, they were experimenting, they were learning. The war trained them all. They said, we can't do this here. You've got to go back to, to, uh, to England, which was great with me. And I stayed in England for quite a while. Beautiful hospital too, really. Uh, near Taunton. Beautiful hospital. I was there quite a while. And I said, finally I said to the guy, what, what, what am I doing here? You know, why don't you send me home? What am I staying here for? Well, we're trying to get a doctor that can operate on you. They couldn't find a doctor that could do it. So they sent me back to the United States now, did you go back on a hospital ship? Yeah, yeah, big ship, yeah. Shot crap, played poker all the way home. I made about $2,000 shooting crap. I lost the one night out of New York. Yeah. We stopped the, the, the hospital ship right near the Statue of Liberty. And we laid there for a day and a half. What are we laying here for? We're shooting crap, poker, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, then you go through a line. They look at your doc doctors, look at your wounds. They want to know where to send you. They had a big hospital up in Utica. A big hospital. Used to be all the crazy houses, all them buildings. Mm -hmm. They were sending all the soldiers there. I said, well, I said, Jesus, you know, I'd like to go to Utica. It's not too far from Schenectady. No, 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 no. We have nobody up there that can do that. You're going to go to Atlantic City. I was pissed off they're sending me to Atlantic City. Once I got there, oh my God. Beautiful hotel. Beautiful. They took over the whole Atlantic City. Every hotel on that boardwalk, the Army took over for soldiers. They made hospitals out of them. But they kept all the civilian personnel in the kitchen. They retained all of them. So all the food they cooked was like if you were a guest. Food was excellent. I was there quite a few months, long time. Long time, nine, ten months I was there, Jesus. Couldn't get a doctor to do this. They didn't have them. Uh, now each time you were wounded, your wife received notification? Yeah. I walked around for months like this, crippled. Couldn't straighten my arm up, but like that. That's how I had to walk. Couldn't straighten my hand out. I said, I'm going to live like this the rest of my life. Of course, if I got out of the arm, I didn't give a goddamn. At that point in my life. I, but I knew I was safe because I was back in this country. They couldn't use me like that, right? When did they finally find somebody to operate on you? I was a young guy. Very young guy. Uh... He apparently was one of the few that could do it. And he operated on me. I'll never forget it. Many years later, 
I went to a, a surgeon in Schenectady for some other operation. And when he was looking me over, he, he looked at the scar. He says, where'd you get that done? Listen to this story. I got it done in Atlantic City, New Jersey. He called his staff in. He said, look at that operation. That's the first one that was ever done like that in the United States in Atlantic City. That's the only place they could do it because they had the surgeons here. And he knew every one of them surgeons, this guy did. He was there himself, but I never seen him. I wouldn't know him anyway. Yeah. But they wouldn't let me out. I said, why don't you let me go home for Christ's sake? What, what am I doing here? Well, aren't you having a good time? Yeah, but I mean, you know, I got a wife and a kid. Uh, I'm making $25 a month. Who the hell can, you know, what, what's, you kidding me? $25 a month. People don't know what the guys went through. They really don't. But all I can say is I was one of 16 million. What the hell, you know? I had a lot of company. A lot of guys got good jobs. A lot of guys suck. When were you finally discharged? <coughs> How was I discharged? Uh, Must have been long after the war, like 46 or 46. 46, yeah, sometime in 46. They kept me in that hospital a long time in Atlantic City. I couldn't believe it. And I couldn't get the guy to send me home. Even after they operated on it, they wouldn't let me go. They wanted to watch it. That's what it was. I know what they were doing. Which was fine. I, I think it was 46 I got out. Did you ever have any residual effects on your... No, never had any trouble. It's amazing. I don't have any feeling. i got to be careful in the wintertime. I could freeze them. Still no feeling in them. Mm -hmm. But I can move them. I never thought I would. I was very lucky. My legs, no problem. I was a very fortunate guy, really. It's a hell of an experience. After you were discharged, uh, did you um, make use of the GI Bill at all? No. Nah. Did you do the 5220 Club? Yeah, I didn't, go, I didn't go back to work for a year. I did. Then when I went back to work, I'll tell you how patriotic the GE was. Who let me go, I got drafted, right? Uh, under the law, it was mandatory that you go back to your job. Mandatory. In one year, they had to give you the job back. That was the law. I went back like maybe three weeks before the year was up. And I walked into the shop I worked in and walked into the office. I says, I want to go back to work on my job over there. It was on a machine. General form made it even worse. He was a goddamn, he was German. And I hated the son of a bitch anyway. No, he says, uh, got no job here for you. I says, you got no job here for me? I says, you don't read English? You don't read the paper? You don't know what the law is? No job for you. I says, I'll be back. I walked from there down to the general superintendent's office. Another no good son of a bitch. I walked over there. They wouldn't let, I sat out there for an hour. He finally, I walk in, sitting in a chair like this. Big American flag on the back, you know. Because he's the guy, when I went to get a deferment, he said to me, don't you want to serve your country? He told me that. Mm -hmm. Now I go back for my job. He's sitting there like that, right? I says, uh, Mr. Collins, I got a little bit of a problem. He said, what's your problem? I said, that punk boss of yours you got down there, that German, won't give me my job back. Well, he says, I don't think there's a job here for you. Oh, when you leaned back in the chair the last time I was here, you want to know why I didn't want to go in the Army. Now, you don't want to give me my job back because I served in the Army for you. I said, let me tell you something, pal. Not only am I going to get my job back, I'm going to probably have you locked up when I'm done. I turned around and walked right out. Them days, the Union was powerful. It was, really. I went down to Union Hall. 
And the business agent was a man named Jandro. Powerful guy. I knew him, but I didn't know him that well. But he was a business agent. So I walked in and sat down. I said, I want to see the business agent. Okay. Walked in his office. Took hands with him. Gave him the story. Told him I was wounded. And everything else, you know. He said, what happened? He says, they won't give me my job back. I said, didn't he tell me who the boss was, who the superintendent was, and the whole story, right? He says, sit there. Picks up the phone. He said, call this Mr. So-and-so, the superintendent of the division. Gets him on the phone. I think his name was, I think it was Harry. And the, and the business agent said, this is Leo Jandro. He says, uh, I got a man in here who your people won't rehire. Just come out of the army wounded. Three medals. And you won't give him his job back. And he told him who I was. It was me. Well, no, he said, we don't have to give him his job at the other end. He said, well, he says, I'll tell you what, before I hang up, be ready for the front page of the Union Star tonight. Because I'm going call to call a cameraman over. I'm going to call an editor over. And we're going to take pictures of this fella. I'm going to put on the front page, General Electric Company refuses to hire a wounded veteran with three medals. Told him on the phone. Well, the guy probably crapped, right? And furthermore, he said, when I'm through talking to you, I'm going to talk to the general superintendent of the whole plant, the general manager. That's why the guy got frightened. He says, send him back, send him back. Me, go back. <laughs> okay, shook hands with the guy. Got my car, drove back to the parking lot, walked into the plant, walked into the building, walked over to this German. I says, that's my machine right over there. But I said, before I do that, I want a card to punch. I want to punch a card. He wrote out a card and handed it to me. He says, go ahead, punch it. Boom. Walked down. I said to the guy, look, I'm sorry, fella. This is my job. You're going to have to get a job somewhere else. And I started to work. That guy didn't come near me for a week, that foreman. Never come near me for a week. Uh, finally, uh, I don't know how it came about, but he did come over and, and start engaging me in a little bit of a conversation. Because then I got very active in the union. I became the, the union representative. And I broke his balls like I never were broke. Did you ever uh, join any veterans organizations? Yeah, sure. We started the, down on Union Street, right across from the old public library, there's, the, uh, there's a big building there. The Vetter McGee family owned that huge mansion, a big red brick building, still there. This Vetter McGee was a very wealthy man. And uh, we were meeting in the Union Hall of Veterans as an organization. He called us up, we met him in his office downtown. He said, I want to give you that building, free. You make a veterans post out, but all I want on it is, is my name in the front of the building that was my building. Why not? Now, as you go back there, all you fellas, and you go down there, whatever has to be done, you call the people up that's got to do it, and let them send the bill to me. Gave us this beautiful building. I'll bet you, within three weeks, I had about 5,000 members. Couldn't get them in the building, naturally. And shortly thereafter, you won't remember this, of course, the John Electric Company went on strike. And I was the chairman of the, the Veterans Committee. We marched down Erie Boulevard on strike. I had about 9,000 9, veterans behind me. Blocked off the street right to the Union Hall. And I was right in the front. Yeah. So I had some good experiences. How do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? Well, <coughs> it's a good question. It affect, how does it affect my life? Well, you know, it's pretty hard as a, as a person to think what you would have done if you didn't get involved in what I got involved in. What would I have done? Maybe I would have went to college. I was a great basketball player. 
I had a full scholarship to Syracuse. I couldn't go. I had to go to work. Full scholarship. That might have happened. I don't know. Probably would have happened. I always wanted to be a lawyer. That surely didn't happen. But all in all, when I look back at it, in retrospect, I, I had a good life. I did a lot of things that I wouldn't have done if I went the other way, really. If I became a lawyer, what would I have been? Another lawyer. I wouldn't have done what I've done. Don't forget, I've been all over the world. I was president of the state chiefs. I was president of every uh, police organization in the world. I was the president. From, from New York State, from Schenectady. I'm talking about Los Angeles, Chicago, big city chiefs, little me. I went all through them chairs, six years it took me to get to be president. Then they sent me, Ronald Reagan sent me all over the world. They paid for it. He became president. He sent me with three guys from the Drug Enforcement uh, Administration. Went to England, France, Germany, Italy. Uh, came home, stayed a month, sent me out to the Far East, all over Hawaii, Filipinos, oh, Philippine Islands, China, Thailand was one of the most beautiful countries I've ever seen in my life was Thailand. People were great people, great people. Treated you wonderfully and very beautiful, beautiful women, really beautiful women. Treated you wonderful. They were glad to see us there. But in uh, them days, of course, Great Britain controlled most of the Far East, you know. Hong Kong, I went to Hong Kong, they owned it. The British owned it. Boy, did they live there. My God, it's beautiful. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank Pleasure. You. Hope it was yes. satisfactory. Yes, sir. <laughs>